Hi, I'm Tracy Dice, and I'm going to be presenting the book Teaching College, chapters five through eight by Norman Ng. Have you ever felt like this in a class before? Have you ever thought that some of your students might feel like this during your class? I know as professors, this is not how we want our students to feel when what we think we're giving are very stimulating lectures that we've crafted over hours and hours. Over the next 15 minutes, we're gonna discuss ways that will make sure that this does not happen to you in any of your future classes. The rest of the presentation will include looking at chapter five, developing your topic, Chapter six, touch the audience. Chapter seven, crafting your lecture outline. Chapter eight, creating slides. And then we're going to wrap up with a challenge. Chapter five discusses developing your topic using four main points. The first being narrowing in on key ideas and calls this niching down. Focus on one to three areas of a topic. Remember what you teach is more important than how much you teach. When you're deciding which areas you need to focus on, think about ideas that are notable, potentially difficult for your students to learn, areas that might be rooted in common misperceptions, or just fundamental principles in your field of teaching. The second main point that you need to focus on when you're developing your topic would be the lesson objective and, and essential questions. The essential question is going to guide your learn lesson objective. In my principles of economics class, I look at the question, how can we determine the price of a product? I then go on to format the lesson objective with what students will be able to do and how. For example, students will use a supply and demand graph to evaluate the appropriate price of a product. Typically, I'll get into more details like what specific product but depending on what's relevant at that time, we might be switching. For instance, at this point, it's what was the price of a pool over the summer? That brings me into the second main point or the third main point for chapter five, making sure that your topic is relevant. Students need to know why this idea is important or meaningful and how they can apply the idea. Also, you need to think about how you can make it easier to understand. That then ties into the fourth main point, which is the underlying idea and universal experience. Like I said, talking about um, my econ class where we look at their experiences with prices over the last six months. Some students worked at a grocery store where they noticed that the price of eggs went up dramatically. Um, and I mentioned the price of a pool in the summer going from $30 to $150. So you wanna make sure you start with an underlying human experience to give the context meaning. Moving on to chapter six, touching the audience. Eng takes this from marketing where they say that it takes seven touches to turn a potential customer into a buyer. Students also need various ways to make sense of information. So it's good to present the, in, the content in multiple or using multiple strategies. The best ways are that strategies that are personal and interactive. Remember to be engaging and also use the approaches that Keely mentioned in the earlier chapters. So use the I, we, you, and the you, y'all, we approaches. Some other potential strategies that Aang gives in his book are these nine that you can also use in your classes. He starts by talking about discussion. Use open-ended questions throughout the lecture. Don't just use them at the end. Also avoid questions that only have one word answers like yes and no. You wanna get your groups thinking. You can also, again, speaking of groups, move on to the second strategy, which is small group work. There are lots of different formats that you can use for small group work. One such that we've talked about and Aang mentions is the jigsaw approach. He also says to make sure that your groups, when you're doing small groups, are heterogeneous, maybe of groups of four to six, 
Make sure they're diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, ab ability, and gender. Managing the groups when you use small group work is critical. Try to help manage them by appointing a leader, being sure to give time frames so students know that time is valuable, and don't let the students choose their groups. If you allow that, they will always choose their friends. The next strategy is debating. Debating is most suited for controversial topics and says such as race, evolution, and string theory. However, you can forego the traditional one-on-one -on -one format and use groups or split the class in half. I've used this in my financial literacy class and my economics classes when we talk about the national budget and whether or not to pass specific policy bills. Debating can be done carefully or must be done carefully and correctly. You don't wanna reinforce existing biases instead of broadening students' understanding. The next um, strategy is sur using surveys and inventories. Look for surveys that match your curriculum. Um, I use a survey about, about personalities in my financial literacy class when we talk about where students want to end up and what type of a career they want to be in. You can check Pinterest for other ideas on how to find or for specific surveys that are dealing with your industry or your area of expertise. The next strategy is looking at role playing or perspective taking. These are used to explore one's values, to solve a problem or to apply skills. Last summer, Dr. Profit gave us a situation to look at um, the financial aspect of selling a business. I got to be a business seller, a business owner who was selling my business and my two classmates were offering um, blind bids for me to use. The difference was, or to choose from. The neat thing about it was I didn't actually know what my company was worth because I wasn't the CEO. I was just a part or I was just the owner. And it gave us an interesting perspective because I obviously valued the company that I owned more than the two potential buyers. And he even manipulated it a little bit so that unless they gave me a really good offer, I was going to turn it down. It was a really interesting way to talk about finance and looking at that aspect of selling a business. When you do these role playing and perspective taking strategies, be sure you debrief at the end of class. You need to make sure you're clarifying any questions that still exist, you're confirming and solidifying other material that the students may not have fully grasped. The next strategy would be demonstration. You want to look at predicting having them experience and then having re them reflect on a demonstration. So if you're, even if you're just watching a movie, have students guess what's gonna happen next. Pause the video and say, what do you think's gonna happen here? Then have them experience it and reflect on it. See if they were right or if they were wrong. If they were wrong, do they go back and talk about why they were wrong and what they might do different next time? The next strategy would be Students, so individual or group presentations. Um, Eng really doesn't seem to like oral presentations because they can be very painful. Um, students tend to just put every word they're gonna say on a slide and then read it to you, which they could just turn it in. Um, and some of their classmates feel the same. So if you're going to use student or group presentations, they need to be taught how to present and how to be engaging for this to be done effectively so that the other students in the class are also learning. Uh, another strategy would be using case studies. Case studies give real world examples and actually put students in the shoes of the stakeholders. So kind of just like the role playing activities that we talked about a few seconds ago or a few minutes ago. The final strategy that Ng talks about is using guest speakers. Guest speakers can be so powerful. Be sure though that you're going, you co-plan the actual talk so you know what they're going to say and try to prepare your students for the talk. Have them prepare questions ahead of time and if possible, submit those questions ahead of time. To make sure that students pay attention, have them list the three most interesting things that the speaker said and then discuss them afterwards. Remember, if you bring in a guest speaker, you should always send a thank you to them. Moving on to chapter seven, 
we talk about crafting your lecture outline. You should always have a beginning, middle, and an end. When you're looking at the beginning, I think about it like you're ready to start a race. Think about the adrenaline that you have when you're starting a race, if you've ever been in any sort of contest. When I look at these ladies lined up on this um, start line, it makes me just think of my track days and how much adrenaline I had. You want that engagement from your students. So Aang provides six ways to get your students engaged immediately. He talks about asking a provocative question, strike a, give a striking statistic or fact, use an anecdote, use a quote, maybe use an analogy, or talk about a simple scenario. Once you've got them hooked, then you've got to move on to the middle. What activities do you use? How do you keep that engagement? What type of activities are appropriate? This is where the nine potential strategies that we talked about on the previous slide come in. Use those to get the students up and moving or just talking and keep that engagement going through you, through your lecture. Finally, we've come to the end. Once you make it to the end of your lecture or the end of your class, make sure you use the end to reinforce what the students learn. Lecture-driven lessons can end in two ways. You can have students, students share their work or their thinking, or you can assess their learning by using exit tickets or mini quizzes. Remember that the end should always connect back to the beginning. Finally, Eng talks about time. It has to be done when? That's kind of how I feel like a lot of students think about our classes. And I think some of us run into that at the end of our class, like, oh my goodness, I have to be done with my lecture. So when you're looking at timing, Eng says that there's no real hard and fast rules, but a good rule of thumb is to spend double the amount of time on activities as on lecturing, leaving aside some time to share, reflect, assess, and reinforce the lesson objectives at the end. You also need to be sure to build in time for miscellaneous elements. So if you need to take a break, if you have a really long class, um, any announcements or transitions you need to do. Eng has some really good tables on pages 139 and 140 about how you should split up your class. If you have a one hour class, if you have an hour and a half class, if you have a two hour and 15 minute class, and if you are more lecture driven or more activity driven. So please check out those two tables. Finally, we come to chapter eight, which is crafting slides and keeping those strategies. I hope you've realized that throughout this presentation, you haven't seen a lot of words. I've really tried to implement his show, don't tell. We need to fix the problems that Keeley talked about. Um, your slides are too long. Uh, he says, use the 10, 20, 30 rule. No more than 10 slides, no more than 20 minutes to present, no less than 30 point font. Make sure you do that and you will make sure your slides are not too long, too dense, you'll make sure they're relevant. And then again, be sure you're not reading directly from the slides. PowerPoints are not supposed to be teleprompters. You've got the notes section to use if you need to, so don't put all of your words on a slide. And I know Keely already said that, so please follow that. So we've talked about how to develop your topic, how to touch the audience, an outline for your lectures, and then finally, some of your slides, how to prepare your slides. The challenge that I'm going to leave you with is I used 29 words on this entire presentation besides the agenda and the title slide. I have never created a presentation with so few words on my slides. So I challenge you to try and create a presentation like this for a future lesson using 50 words or less. Good luck and thank you for your time. Here are the two references I used.